Well, good morning. Everybody excited for day one? Yeah! All right. It's going to be a great day. Uh, as I uh, did introductions last night, uh, I, I got to share that um, I was here with my wife and kids. I'm going to get that in a minute. But I just want to say uh, what I've been praying for you and been praying for our week together and for you that will be here next week is that God would do for you what he did for me when I was sitting where you sat. And that was that God totally transformed my life, my view of Him, my understanding of Him, my desire to live for Him. He stretched me in my musical abilities, as, as though Graham alluded to. That wasn't the primary reason I came to camp. We'll get to that later in the week, maybe. But God did more than I could imagine in my time here, and that's what my heart is for you. Uh, but I am here with my wife and my kids. Some of you know them, some of you don't. Uh, but I wanted to do something this morning just to start out which is, I, I want to prove for you the existence of God, all right? Most of you probably aren't doubting, but in case you are, uh, and this is one of my friends, actually one of my good friends, came up with this argument for God's existence, and he said that it was proof that God existed that that girl married that guy. <laughs> and he said that at our wedding reception, so he calls it the Danological argument for the existence of God. So... You can know for sure that God exists because she married me 14 years ago. So, uh, but sure do. And then I am love being a dad. My, this is my Lena Joy. She's eight. She'll be nine in August. And that's Evan Daniel. And uh, you'll see them uh, running around with the other herd of children that are here this week. But uh, I, I love being a dad. And I think, I think my favorite word in this whole world is daddy. So. That's just a little bit about me and, and who I am. But this week, uh, we're going to be in Ephesians. And in the book of Ephesians, Paul really lays out for the church the, the beautiful and glorious reality of the riches that we have in Christ. And so we're going to be looking at this new life. Paul, he wanted the church, the, the people of God, those who knew Jesus as their Savior, he wanted them to, to understand and to grasp the riches that they had in Christ and who they were in Christ, their identity in Christ. He, he wanted them to understand that because they lived in a world that in many ways was a lot like ours, minus, minus Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat. Are you with me? Right? What, what I mean is they lived in a world that was very hostile to the gospel. They, they lived in a, in a culture that, that was filled with idolatry. Right? In, in Ephesus, there was, a, there was a, a lot of idolatry. There was the temple of Artemis or Diana. Right? There, there was idolatry that was rampant. It was an anti-God, anti-Christian uh, culture that they lived in. And Paul wanted the church to be strong. He wanted them to, to know who they were in Christ and how to live that out. So this week we're going to look at Ephesians 1. Uh, through 2.10. And if you're with us next week, we're going to look at several passages in the second half of, uh, of, of Ephesians. But I'm excited for us to see what, what God has for us. So our, each day I, I'm going to kind of have one word to summarize what we're looking at. So our, our word for today is grasp. And my prayer for you this morning is that you would begin to grasp in a fresh way the, the, the beautiful realities of the gospel. Right? And, and I don't know about you, but, but if we simply think about the, the, the enormity of our faith and who God is and, and what God's done for us, sometimes it's, it's hard to wrap our minds around. Now, that's not the only thing that it's hard to wrap your mind around. Uh, I found this right here is something that's hard for my mind to wrap around. Anybody, anybody would join me in saying that, that that makes your head hurt? Anybody? All right. A few of you. Some of you have probably already solved it, right? We, the rest of us hate you, right? <laughs> Dislike, sorry. Um, <laughs> hate in the Christian love way, you know. <laughs> so there are things like math was never my thing. So there are things that, that we struggle to, to grasp. And my prayer for us this morning is that, that we would grasp in a fresh way who Christ is. And, and that in, in grasping that, we would be challenged and motivated and encouraged to live out your identity in Christ. And that phrase, in Christ, is, is really important in, in Ephesians and in Paul's writing. He wants us to understand our position, right? Our spiritual position being in Christ. But, but we don't want to just understand it. We want to be able to let it change the way that we live, right? That we would live out those riches. Uh, a few years ago, 
had the opportunity to travel to the Dominican Republic. And, and as we were going around, everywhere we'd go, we'd hear this phrase, and it was this. It was, Dios te bendiga. Now, you have to, you're going to have to forgive my Spanish, right? I, um, I don't speak Spanish. But I'd hear this phrase everywhere. Anybody want to guess what that means? You don't get to guess. Any guesses? Yes, in the back. God bless you. God bless you. That is 100% correct. All right, God bless you. And so everywhere you'd go, when people saw you, right, they'd say, Dios te bendiga, God bless you. But that was, and that, and that wasn't maybe terribly, you know, unusual. We say God bless you to people. When do we usually say it? Sneeze. Someone sneezes, which, you know, that's fine, right? But, 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 you know, God is a God who's interested in blessing his children, not just when they sneeze. Are you with me? Right? And so... What they would do is when someone would say, Dios te bendiga, what, what was interesting what was what they said next. They would say this. They would say, Dios te bendiga mas. Somebody help me out here. Yes. God bless you more. And so that was what got, got my attention. You know, I'd, you know, God bless you wasn't so, so unusual, but they would say, no, God bless you more. You see, God is a God who's interested in blessing his children. I, I want us to grasp that this morning, that God is a blessing God. Throughout the, the Bible, we read stories of, uh, of God blessing his people. In fact, when God created Adam and Eve, the first thing that he did in Genesis chapter 128 is he what? It's the Bible says he, he blessed them. God's blessing is his favor, right? His kindness and his approval, right? And love, love always desires to bless the object of its affection, Love always desires to bless the object of its affection. I'm a, I'm a dad, right? I, I want to bless my kids. Now, that doesn't mean giving them everything they want, right? That doesn't mean doing everything they want. That doesn't mean that I don't discipline them, right? That doesn't mean I don't correct or teach. It doesn't mean that sometimes I don't withhold something that they want because from my perspective, it's not good for them or it's not the right time. But love always desires to bless the object of his affection. In the Old Testament, the word for blessing is used over 330 times, right? God is a blessing God. So as Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, he wants them to know and to grasp. Now, he's writing in about between 60 and 62 AD, right? And, and many of you may be familiar with the letter to the church at Ephesus. It was located in what we would know today as the country of Turkey, but then Asia Minor. And so Paul's writing there to a church that he loved greatly. He had lived there for three years. He had known these people and led many of them to Christ and discipled them and, and grew this church. And so he's writing them and he, he wants them to grasp the blessing of God, and to live it out boldly. So we're going to begin this morning with the first three verses uh, of Ephesians. So if you have your Bible, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And let's read it together. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus, and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So let's just make a few observations. And you know, first of all, Paul introduces himself as an apostle. Now that word means messenger, one who is sent. Uh, and here, in, in this instance, Paul's using it not just to say he's a messenger, one sent, but also referring to his spiritual authority. Right? There were 12 original apostles right, that, that Jesus had commissioned. One was replaced, Judas, right, we knew was a traitor, but Matthias replaced him. But then God calls Paul through Jesus to be an apostle. Right? Jesus encounters Paul on the road to Damascus. He hated Christians. He persecuted the church, but God's grace radically intersected his life and changed him forever. And so Paul's writing, he says, I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So he's saying, my authority in writing to you this letter is not my own. Right? I am a messenger of Christ. I'm an apostle. I'm commissioned by God. And so he wanted them to know this, this is a message not just from Paul, but from God. And then he says, to the saints who are in Ephesus. It's a key word. This word right away in, in the beginning of Paul's letter is a kind of a clue for us. Right? Uh, of the blessing that God has given to his people in that he calls us Saints. Now, I want to ask you a question. How many of you typically think of yourself as a saint? Anybody? One. All right. <laughs> There's always one, right? 
Well, actually, you're right, right? Because that's who you are in Christ. I want you to realize, that's what we're talking about grasping, that you, God can say, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've been born again, if you know Jesus, if you've believed on Him as your Savior, then you are in the eyes of God considered to be a saint, right? So, when you see each other today, right, you can refer to each other as Saint so-and-so, all right? It might feel weird, but you'd be correct in doing that. What is saint? It means to be holy. It means to be set apart. And it was a reminder of that that's who you are now and you're to live that out. So Paul reminds them, as you're saints, right? And, and we listen, we all need reminders of who we are. Right? Because it's easy to forget, right? It's easy to lose sight. And, you know, in our world, in our culture, right, we, we, we seek to find identity from so many different things and in so many different ways. But I want you to realize this morning that God wants you to see your identity as shaped by who He's made you to be, both through creation, but also through salvation. That your identity has been shaped and forged by what Jesus has done for you and who He's made you to be in Christ. And so you are a saint. And then He, he greets them with, these words, grace and peace. Now, these were typical of Paul's greetings, and, and grace was a, a typical Greek greeting, and peace was a typical Hebrew greeting, and so Paul sort of takes them and combines them, but he does so in a pretty extraordinary way, because he says, grace to you and peace from who? From me? No. From who? From God. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is, this is pretty extraordinary. He says, grace and peace are available to you from God through Jesus Christ. Now, I, I just want us to kind of to step back. Grace is, is, is something we could spend weeks talking about. In fact, a few years ago, we spent two weeks talking about the subject of grace in chapels. Right? But God's grace. Grace is getting something that you don't deserve. How many of you ever got something, in, in a positive way, how many of you ever gotten something you didn't deserve? All right, you've all experienced, you've all tasted grace. My kids have gotten extraordinary amounts of grace, right? They have no idea, right, how much grace they've gotten. How many times their life should have been ended, right? <laughs> now, now, see, now don't, now I'm, you, you, listen, you're thinking about it the wrong way. My kids have developed this habit, especially my son, that after church, when I'm greeting people, they like to come up to me behind me and just whack me, right? And then run away. And there's a verse in the Bible that says if children strike their parents, that you can stone them, all right? And I often remind them of that, but it doesn't seem to deter them at all. So I don't know if I'm doing the parenting thing right or not, but my kids may need therapy. But grace, getting what you don't deserve, right? He says, you've been given, you, you have no idea, right? Because in God's eyes, the Bible says every one of us are what? We are guilty. We are all dead in our sin and our trespasses. Every one of us has sinned against God, right? No one is righteous, but no, not one. We are all sinful people, right? That's what makes all of us the same, right? We all come from different places, different backgrounds. We all have different stories. But there's one common thing that we all share, is that we all have rebelled in our hearts against our Creator. Right? And yet God offers grace. Right? He offers not just forgiveness, but He offers His life in you. He offers His life given to you. He offers you eternal life, the life of God in you now and with Him forever. Right? Right? God would be gracious just to forgive your sin, but He doesn't just forgive your sin. He offers you Himself. He offers you life. He offers you hope. He offers you peace. Right? And so he says, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no real peace for your soul apart from Christ. Right? Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says this. It says, therefore since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, because we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God. God. That, that if you know Christ is your Savior, you're no longer at odds with God. There's no longer tension in the relationship, right? Because you have been restored to a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. There's peace with God. But not just peace with God, there's the peace of God. Look at John chapter 14 verse 27. The night before Jesus goes to the cross. He says, peace I leave with you. 
My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. He says, peace I leave with you. Right? I, I, I'm, leaving. I'm about to go. And they, they didn't really understand all of what was going to happen. They, they couldn't wrap their minds around it. But he says, my peace is something I want you to have. He says, I'm leaving with you. I'm giving it to you. So, and I don't give like the world gives. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. The Jewish people, they treasured and still do the concept of peace, of shalom, right? of, of well-being, of, of, of a being of, of mind and soul and body, of completeness, of soundness, of welfare. How many of you say that sounds pretty good? Anybody? Say, I could use a little bit of that. Right? Well, Jesus offers that. It, it, Philippians chapter 4, verse 7 says, The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Right? We have the opportunity to experience grace and peace. And so as Paul is writing, even in his introduction, right, he's wanting them to grasp. He's wanting them to get a hold of, of the riches that they have in Christ. They've been made to be saints. Right? Not because they were saintly people, right? They were sinful people that Jesus saved and transformed and gave them a new label and a new story. They're saints of God and they are recipients of God's grace and God's peace. Jesus wants us to experience his peace because he himself, right, he is our peace. Right, so many times we, we, we look for peace through, through circumstances or situations. Listen, life will often bring circumstances and situations that are not peaceful, right, that are stressful, that are filled with anxiety and fear and worry and doubt and all those emotions that we all experience and we all go through. But it's in the midst of those that God wants you to realize His peace is available to guard your heart, to guard your mind, to guard you. And so Paul wanted them to, to grasp that. Then let, let's look at verse 3 again just for a few moments. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That word blessed is, is a word that we get our word eulogy from. Now when do you usually hear a eulogy? Help me out here. At a funeral. Right? Which is great. But it's really also kind of sad, right? What, that we wait until someone's dead to bless them, right? Right? That, that God is a blessing. God, as His saints, right? As His people, right? We have the capacity to speak blessing over people's lives. And Paul does that here. He says, blessed, and this is pretty neat. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he starts out by using this word as a way of giving praise to God. So he says, let there be praise to God, right? The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But then he uses the same word to say, who has blessed us, right? He says, blessed be God who has blessed us. Same word. What's he mean? He has blessed us, he says, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Paul wanted the church to begin to grasp the riches of God's blessing and His goodness and His love and His mercy and His grace. And as we go throughout this week and as we go throughout chapter 1 and into chapter 2, we're going to unpack some of those blessings and, and look at what Paul says. Because here in verse 3, Paul's actually beginning a sentence that goes all the way through verse 14. So if you're a grammar person, this is a, a major, major run-on sentence. All right? But Paul just probably had, you know, so, you know how sometimes you just, you just got to get it out, Right? And he just writes a really, really long sentence here. So we're going to be looking at some of these blessings. But I want you to realize that the blessings that God has for you are in Christ. You know, so many times we, we think blessings are going to be found through searching them out, whether it's through stuff or entertainment or the pursuit of pleasure or success or recognition or self-promotion. Right? All the things that our culture says are blessings. Right, but what we see in the gospel and what we see Jesus teaching is that life in Christ is, is an upside down way of living compared to the way culture and the world says to live. And really that's what I want you to grasp is that, that God has blessed you and that your riches are so great but it's going to cause you to live a life that's, that's very different. And listen, we need God's blessing. Right? God's blessing isn't just like a nice thing. It's something that you and I desperately need. His blessing, again, is His favor, His approval, His power on our life. 
Right? God wants to bless us. But we're going to see that there are some things that we need to do in response to live out or experience God's blessings in our life. So I want to give you, I want to give you three words r- real quickly right? that I think will help us to think about how how do I experience this, right? It's all wonderful that we can read this and, and even believe that it's true. But how do, we, how do we move from believing it's true to living it out, right? To, to actually experiencing it. So I'm going to give you three words. The first word is faith. Faith. It requires faith. Right? God has orchestrated that we would have to exercise something called faith. Now, all of you are exercising faith right now. Right? Or you did a few moments ago. When you sat down in that chair, whether you realize it or not, you exercised faith in that chair. You believed that it would what? Hold you up. Right? How many of you ever looked at a chair and believed that it would not hold you up? All right. One time, somebody invited me over to their house. I was pastoring in Florida, had just been there for a few months. And I said, Sure, sit down. I sat down, and the chair broke. <laughs> and he's like, Oh, yeah, that's the broken one. I said, <laughs> Thanks. See, because he told me to sit there, I had faith in the chair, right? I trusted, right? But, but faith is only as good as the object you place it in, right? And so our faith in Christ is essential, right? We have to live by faith. Paul said it like this. He said, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And this life I now live in the body, I live by what? Faith. In the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says, I don't understand everything. I don't know everything. Right? Because you can't know everything about God. You can't understand everything about God. But there are some things you can see and know and understand. Right? And Jesus is the fullest revelation of God. And God's given us his word that we would know Jesus and know him. And then in faith, trust him. And so if you're going to experience the blessing of God, it has to begin with faith. Right, that initial faith, right, when you trusted Christ as your Savior, maybe you're here and you say, I, I've never done that. Well, I want to invite you to know that the God of heaven loves you, right, and he sent his son Jesus to live for you. And Jesus not only lived for you, but he died for you. But he didn't just die for you, he rose from the dead for you. And he appeared to his followers and he ascended to the Father. And he's coming again. And he's invited you and I by faith to believe him and to receive his life and to receive his blessings. But for those of us who have already received him, we have to continue in faith to trust him. And so it requires faith. If we're going to grasp the truth that Paul wants us to, to grasp, we have to have faith. Number two, it requires focus. How many of you struggle with focus? All right. I struggle with focus, right? It's easy to get distracted. But we have to focus our minds on the truth of God's Word. We see throughout Scripture that our mind is so key. right? And how many of you say, a lot of battles take place between your ears? Anybody? All right. Like sometimes you say like a whole war being fought out there. Anybody with me? Right? You're not alone. But we have to focus our minds. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, and set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So he says you have to set your mind, right? Just like you may have set an alarm to wake up, or how many of you trusted your counselor to wake you up? All right. Sometimes the alarm is actually more gentle, all right? Just a warning there. It's going to get worse, all right? They may have been kind this morning, but by Thursday, they will not be kind. (laughs) We have to set our minds, right? It it requires a focusing of our mind, right? That, That we need to focus our mind on the truths of the gospel. He says, if you've been raised with Christ, if you know Christ, seek what's above, live for Christ. But he says, set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, your old life has died. And he says, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Number three, we need to pray. We need to pray. We must seek the Lord in prayer and claim what is ours in Christ. Right? God calls us as his people to claim his blessings on our lives. 
And we do that through prayer. And so I'm going to ask you in just a couple of moments, even just before we leave this place and go on to a great, great day, to pray a prayer that while you're here, whether it's one week or two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, that you would grasp in a fresh way who Jesus is and who He is in your life and how He wants you to, to live out those truths. And, and I believe this. I believe God will answer that prayer. Now, you're not going to understand everything. Grasping the realities and the beauty of the gospel is a lifelong journey. But I believe God will lead you to take a step in your faith. I believe God always answers prayer, but particularly He answers prayers that are according to His will. And it's His will that you would know Him. It's His will that you would grow in your knowledge of Him. It's His will that you would trust Him more. And so I believe that if you'll pray that prayer, if you'll just simply ask God, say, God, help me to grasp you and the gospel and Jesus in a greater way than I ever have before. Help me to grasp the blessings that are mine. Help me to, to understand the riches that I have in Christ. I believe if you'll pray that, God will answer that prayer. Now, blessed doesn't mean getting everything you want. Blessed doesn't mean the American dream. Blessed doesn't mean health. Blessed doesn't mean prosperity. Blessed doesn't mean success in the world's eyes. Right? Blessing means God's favor and approval on your life to accomplish the purpose that He created you for. And we're going to finish up the week looking at Ephesians 2 about that purpose. But blessed is, is something that we have, absolutely have to have. So faith, focus, and prayer. It's, it's my desire that you would grasp deeply the love that God has for you, the grace He's offered you, the peace that He's offered you, the blessing that He wants to speak over your life. And so I just want you to, to just think about that. And I just want to read the words of a, a song. It was written by a man named Stuart Townsend. And I just want you to listen to these words because I think they'll help you as you think about praying that prayer. And uh, he said this. He said, How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He sh would give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns His face away. As wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. So I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Would you bow your heads this morning? And just, just in the quietness of this moment with your head bowed, I, I just want to invite you just, just in the next 15 seconds to just say a simple prayer to say, God, would you help me to grasp the blessings that are mine in Christ? Help me to grasp the gospel. Help me to grasp your love. Help me to grasp my identity in Christ. Would you just pray that right now? Father, I pray for, for all of us this morning. I, I thank you that you've brought us together for this week. I, I, I'm excited to see what you're going to do in and through our lives as, and in and through the lives of these students as they grow, as they're stretched, as they're challenged, as they form new relationships, as they, as they go through all that. But Father, I pray that more than anything, they would grasp who you are and the blessing that you want to place over their life. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.